Good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Sanjay Reddy, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, on understanding Xi Jinping's grand reform strategy. Uh, and uh, of course, the topic uh, is of great interest to, to many of us who are trying to understand what is happening in China. But it's a special pleasure um, that we have here with us uh, for a few weeks now uh, somebody whom I admire very much um, and have known for, had the privilege to know for some years, uh, Zui Jiyuan, who is um, uh, a professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing and uh, was previously a professor at MIT, uh, where I first got to know him, that is, in, when he was a professor there. Uh, and uh, who I would say is one of the most uh, creative and interesting uh, scholars working on China. And uh, of course, he's more than a scholar. He's also a, um, uh, a person who's trying to think through what the potential future trajectory of China and indeed of the world as a whole could be. Uh, one of the first uh, essays of his, which I came across, was an article on township and village enterprises in China, which introduced the concept of Möbius strip ownership, uh, by which he meant a form of ownership in which it was not clear who were the outsiders and who were the insiders. If you think about the concept of a Möbius strip, if you know what that is, uh, the brilliance of this metaphor will be immediately clear to you. And uh, this is just one example of the many really striking formulations uh, which he brings to bear, drawing on his very uh, extensive, uh, really magisterial knowledge of a wide number of fields. It's not uncommon in any one of his articles to find references to f diverse traditions of philosophy, to economics. In fact, he knows much more e economics than most economists, though formerly he's a political scientist, uh, to law and legal theory, uh, social theory, history, and so on. Uh, and most recently, of course, in his work on the Chongqing experiment, which he spoke about uh, last Friday um, here at the New School. Among other things, uh, of course, uh, he's the editor of the consolidated volume of Roberto Unger's work, Politics. And he uh, has written uh, his own manifesto for petit bourgeois socialism. You can ask him more about what that means. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to invite him to come and speak to us now for about 40 minutes, uh, after which we have some very distinguished discussants uh, whom I will introduce at that time. Thank you, uh, thank you Sanjay, for your very nice introduction. And uh, it's my great pleasure to visit the new school and. Uh, especially Indian China Institute. I uh, enjoyed the New School as well as New York City a great deal. And uh, I also want to thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, he, he Sanjay just mentioned uh, my early essay on mobile strip ownership. Uh, so it's a great pleasure. Actually, this innovation is not due to me. And uh, I, I draw it from my former colleague and mentor, Charles Sable, uh, now teaching at Columbia Law School and many other friends and uh, colleagues who came uh, this evening. I was asked by Ashuk, uh, the director of Indian China Institute in the New School, to talk about uh, Xi Jinping's grand reform strategy. As many of you know, uh, last November, uh, Chinese Communist Party held the third plenary meeting, uh, third plenary session of the 18th uh, the Central Committee of the 18th Party Congress. And uh, uh, in this plenary session, uh, uh, the CCP Central Committee announced 60 points grand reform strategy. It has been broadly perceived by um, all over the world as a manifesto of Xi Jinping's new idea about what China is moving to. And since he assumed the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and the state. And uh, uh, however, these 60 points uh, 
third plenum resolution has been subject to competing interpretations. Um, there are some, seems there are some ambiguities. And both in, uh, in China and, and in the West, there are a lot of debate what the precise meaning of those 16 points resolution. And as many of you may recall, uh, in the last November, right after the communique of the third plenary session of the 18th Party Congress has been announced, like New York Times, uh, Forbes, and they all uh, published articles say uh, it was disappointing. There are no uh, uh, grand vision of new opening for reform. That's the communique of the plenary session. But uh, the second day, when the full test of the resolution was published, and the New York Times and Forbes and Times, they, they all changed the tone, saying that the communique and the full test were so different. And uh, the full test actually is more uh, promising about reform. And uh, as well, uh, in China, also a lot of debate what are the intention of Xi Jinping in these 60 points of reform. So what I'm trying to do uh, today, I mean, uh, uh, is just my personal interpretation uh, uh, of the, this third plan uh, resolution. And uh, I think uh, 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 my, the structure of my talk will be very simple. Uh, so basically, maybe I, I should start with this. The structure of this presentation is the first I make a distinction of the overall goal and the framework goals of this third plenum decision. And then I talk a little bit about the local experiments that follows the framework goals. And uh, thirdly, I will uh, talk about two examples of framework goal, namely the point six of this Xi Jinping's 60 points reform resolution and the point 20 of this uh, reform resolution. And uh, f finally, uh, um, uh, I will talk about the examples of briefly, very briefly, the local experiments which supposed to realize uh, those uh, framework goals. Um, so, I, uh, but uh, uh, first let me say why I talk about the overall goal because both in Chinese media and the Western media, right after the 18th Party Congress third plenary session, which was, as I mentioned, is last November, the press emphasis is mostly on the so-called decisive role in to let market play in the decisive role in the resource or location. Because in the communique, the first day of announcement, this word was not in communique, but in the full test, this word was in the full test. So the most media emphasize this is very promising because in the early party Congress, uh, uh, the phrase was that uh, to let the market playing a fundamental role in resource allocation. But this time, the new phrase is to allow market to play a decisive role in resource allocation. Um, but however, my interpretation is different because I think the, uh, I do not see there is a so <laughs> fundamental difference between the to allow market to play a fundamental role and uh, to allow market to play a decisive role. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, but uh, my emphasis actually is on the so-called overall goal uh, in the beginning of the test because uh, this is the first time uh, in the old party resolutions in the last two decades uh, this overall goal of reform has been explicitly announced. So the, uh, thus, to quote uh, this from the original test, uh, the overall goal of deepening reform is to develop and make it more perfect, the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics, and to modernize the system and the capacity of governance of the state. So uh, why I use this uh, highlighted with the Right line, because the, the first sentence uh, to develop and make it more perfect, the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics has been in the previous party congresses for the last two decades. But what is really new is 
this to modernize the system and the capacity of governance of the state. And you see, this is the overall goal, the Zong Mu Biao, the overall goal. And then, my understanding is that uh, uh, because there was some debate uh, among Chinese scholars after this third plenary session, uh, because some people say um, the system of governance means the rule of law governance, or some other scholar emphasized that rule of law is not enough. We should the rule of virtue. We should add rule of virtue plus rule of law. But uh, my interpretation is different from those scholars because I think if by governance, we only mean, like Xi Jinping only mean rule of law or rule of virtue, then there's no point to make a distinction between capacity uh, and the system of the governance. Because uh, um, if, like, even in the one same state uh, and the one same system of governance, but given time, in different time period, um, the capacity of governance could be very different, right? If you think about the United States, that uh, during the New Deal period, uh, we, maybe we can say the uh, capacity of governance increased a lot, but of course, this increase of capacity of government eventually led to the fundamental reformation of the system of governance in the United States after New Deal. Um, so I think uh, uh, what I'm trying to give explanation also as I Many years ago, I, I learned from my colleague, uh, Charles Sable, on this uh, mobile strip uh, 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 metaphor. Uh, I also draw from uh, uh, Chuck Sable and uh, Jonathan Zetlin's work recently on the experimental governance. And uh, I try to argue that uh, actually this Xi Jinping's distinction between system and the capacity of governance can be interpreted uh, as, a, as a way to try to introduce experimental governance uh, into China or to formalize what has been implicit in Chinese practice. Uh, so the experimental governance can be understood as an effort to strengthen the system of governance by increasing the capacity of the governance. Uh, okay, so I will quote from Sibyl and Zetlin's uh, article for the Oxford Handbook of Governance, just called Experimental Governance. Um, uh, so it's basically, uh, this experimental governance is, a, I highlight in the red, is a recursive process of a provisional goal setting and the revision based on learning from comparison, comparison of alternative approaches to advancing them in different contexts. And it consists of basically four elements. So the first is the broad framework goals and the metrics for gauging their achievement are provisionally established. So emphasize this broad framework goal were, are provisionally established and the second, I emphasize in this red, red, red line, the local units are given broad discretion to pursue these goals in their own way. And uh, thirdly, as a condition of this autonomy, these units must report regularly on their performance and uh, participate in a peer review in which their results are compared with those of others employing different means to the same end. And uh, fourth and lastly, the goals, matrix, and the decision-making procedures themselves are periodically revised by a widening circle of actors in response to the problem of, and the possibilities revealed by the um, review process and the cycle repeats. And then, uh, Sibyl and Zitlin argue that this experimentalist governance can be viewed in a philosophical sense uh, as an American pragmatist philosopher, John Dewey, uh, 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 because they systematically provoke thought about their own assumption and the practice, treat all solutions as incomplete and uh, 
corrigible and produce an ongoing reciprocal adjustment of ends and means through comparison of different approach to advancing common general aims. So why I found this framework uh, helpful in uh, illustrate and in, to interpret this is Xi Jinping's grand reform strategy. Because uh, uh, there is a lot of debate in China as well in the West uh, about what is precisely Xi Jinping's up to and what's the point of these 60 points uh, of reform plans. And so I, I will uh, argue that overall goal, I just mentioned, uh, the overall goal is uh, and then the, these 60 points, many of the 16 points can be understood as a provisional framework goals in Cebu and Zetlin's sense. And then many localities, different provinces in China uh, are conducting local experiments to follow, uh, to, to realize those provisionally determined framework goals. And, uh, the different localities have different experiments. And ideally, I mean, they, they should have peer review. And then finally, to have this reciprocal adjustment between end and means and to reevaluate the, those provisional goals in the first place. And uh, uh, so I, I will uh, uh, talk about two examples in the point six and the point 20 in this third plenary session, the resolution. And I'd also talk two examples very briefly uh, to realize these two framework goals. So, the, so this framework goal uh, in the point six, uh, uh, that's the original Chinese uh, formulation, but uh, uh, the English translation is roughly as this. This is my, uh, roughly my own translation uh, based on some unofficial translation. Um, so this, uh, in the point six of this uh, third plenary resolution, is for the first time they, make, they made uh, three new formulations. Uh, one is actively develop a diversified ownership economy. Diversified ownership, integrate the state capital, a collective capital, and the private capital. Uh, so mixed enterprise will be allowed to utilize employee stock ownership to form a vested community of capital owners and workers. And then um, improve state-owned assets management system and strengthen state asset supervision by focusing on capital management. Uh, so this word uh, requires some explanation by focusing on capital management. What does it mean? Be because uh, in the Chinese language, it's called cong. Uh, so, but, uh, so as distinct from the guan zi chan, but in English translation, both zi chan and zi ben, both translate as a capital. So it's not uh, so clear, but what does it mean by capital management? My personal idea is that uh, it's more like uh, portfolio management, but by guan zi chan means, uh, because basically he means that uh, 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 state capital would be more like uh, Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett uh, investment company, uh, they invest in many, many different enterprises. Uh, just uh, the day before yesterday, I read in the news that uh, uh, I mean, maybe for the first time, uh, Buffett made a huge loss in this energy future holding two days ago. But uh, but anyway, but Buffett's point is that uh, he doesn't want to be a controlling shareholder because a controlling shareholder require intervention in micro management. But the portfolio in investment is just uh, in, in some way like a free ride on the creativity of the other entrepreneurships. And uh, uh, so I think this uh, emphasis on the so-called Focusing on the capital management is in contrast to very detailed micro management of, of state-owned enterprises. And so 
as I said, establish a number of state-owned capital operating companies and back the transformation of qualified state-owned enterprises into state-owned investment companies, transfer some state-owned capital to social security funds, improve state-owned capital operation budget system, and increase the proportion of state capital gain paid in public financing to 30% by 2020, which will be used to ensure and improve people's livelihood. Because uh, this is also for the first time uh, the party resolution explicitly requires that by 2020, state-owned companies has to uh, deliver up to 30%, uh, deliver 30% of their revenue to the state budget. But so far, uh, they, they haven't been able to do it. So at the most, they, uh, since 2007, 2008, they gave 15%. Uh, and, uh, but uh, this uh, point six, why I say is, uh, in language of experimental governance, should be understood as a framework goal, uh, as a provisionally determined and subject to experiment and further revision. But because uh, actually um, there were a lot of debate among Chinese uh, intellectuals, but also the many uh, uh, practitioners on the meaning of the point six, because some people, uh, especially more uh, kind of right-wing economists, but <laughs> if we assume we understand what that means, um, they emphasize only the term by focusing on capital management on the portfolio management of state capital, meaning that state will reduce their intervention in the micromanagement. And uh, by the so-called mixed ownership or diversified ownership economy only means the retreat of state uh, capital's controlling share. So they emphasize this point. But other scholars uh, emphasize that uh, we have to um, understand these three points uh, more, uh, in a more integrated way. So these three points I, I reiterate is that uh, first, uh, uh, mixed ownership enterprise will be allowed to utilize employee stock ownership to form a vested community of capital owners and the workers. So this is, was the first time in the party resolution especially mentioned employee stock ownership. Why? Because uh, um, this, uh, I haven't been able to translate it to Chinese, but uh, basically in the 2000, uh, in the December of 2000, Chinese Security Exchange Commission uh, uh, has a ruling that uh, for any listed company, uh, they must get rid of employee stock ownership. Because in the reform of student enterprises in the late 80s and 1990s, there are some like trade unions uh, get a hold of some of the former state owned shares. But the regulation of Chinese Security Exchange Company uh, Commission in, the 2000, in 2000 is that, so if you want to be a public listed company, you must get eliminate um, employee sh um, shareholding plan. So as many of you know, the most uh, famous, uh, maybe uh, Chinese uh, internet and, and uh, electronic equipment company, it named Huawei, actually is 98% owned by employees, not only the top management, but really the general employees, 98%. Huawei is, the, is already uh, surpassed, like last month, the Ericsson as the number one world electronic equipment ma maker, but it is 98%. Employee owners, so, but uh, this is not. It is. It is not public listed. So if uh, Huawei want to be listed as a public company in the, in the Shanghai and the Shenzhen ex exchange, they must uh, eliminate. Uh, so their uh, employee ownership plan. However, um, I, it seems to me that uh, this third plenary sessions uh, resolution requires Chinese Security Exchange Commission uh, to change their regulation in December 2000, which is very much 
out of date. But so this is another emphasis. For example, myself has been emphasizing this point. But so different, like maybe the neoliberal economists emphasizing state capital will only become portfolio capital, no micromanagement. But uh, people maybe like me emphasize employee stock ownership plan, but other people em emphasize other aspects. So there's a uh, uh, lot of debate, and uh, but I found, uh, but I, uh, after talking uh, with uh, Chuck Sable, I, I realized that uh, actually if we understood uh, this point six as a framework goal, as a provisionally agreed upon by different uh, stakeholders in the Chinese economy and society. And then uh, we see different provinces recently passing different uh, policies try to implement this mixed ownership or diversified ownership. Then maybe we, uh, uh, if somehow we can also have a peer review to judge the result of this different approach to the same goal of mixed ownership. Then, uh, that is a more, uh, in a way, it's more interesting interpretation than the, like a different uh, interpreters emphasizing one point of, of this six, uh, I mean, the point six on mixed ownership. And so interestingly, the two months ago, Shanghai has first published their uh, policies regarding Shanghai, the municipal, the Shanghai locally owned state capital, uh, state assets. And just uh, two days ago, uh, the news was that uh, Chongqing, which has been working uh, there to take a leave of absence one, one and a half year, uh, Chongqing two, two days ago has uh, uh, announced that they are going to publicize their decision on Chongqing local government owned state assets. And uh, the news didn't, uh, still hasn't reported the full documents, but uh, in Chongqing's case, uh, the mayor, Huang Qifan, uh, I mean, uh, who was the mayor in Boxi last time, but he's still the mayor. And uh, he, um, uh, so, uh, make an interesting distinction. He thinks the mixed ownership or diversified form of ownership, in, at least in Chongqing, can take five different forms of mixed ownership. So one is what he called TAMSEC, like this is Singapore, Singapore state controlling share company. But another is, he exactly mentioned this Buffett type of, so, so Buffett, Buffett type of uh, mixed ownership means the state capital is more about portfolio management, will not take a controlling share. But in the time sec, the Singapore type means the state capital will still have a controlling share. And in Shanghai, like last month, uh, uh, Shanghai published their uh, policy and uh, give a lot of emphasis on the so-called uh, uh, to, to list the state-owned company as a whole in the stock market in Shanghai, Shenzhen, or Hong Kong, or the United States. So because before, uh, when uh, uh, a company uh, w was listed in stock exchange, usually they inject some capital into this listed company from the parent group. But the Shanghai's idea was to inject almost all good assets into the public listed company. So that this public listed company will become the main, not, not the parent, unlisted company. So this Shanghai's experiment very much in the Chinese word called the zhengti shangshi. Um, and uh, so different, we can see the uh, different um, experiment in uh, different localities and also the Guangzhou uh, also announced their um, program. Uh, okay, so now no, I'll talk about another example of frame go, which is the point 20 of this 60 point uh, reform program. Oh, by the way, why it's 16 points? There was a joke, Maybe some, because Chairman Mao in the early 60s has a 16 points uh, work method with regarding the rural socialist transformation. Uh, so some people say Xi Jinping mimic uh, uh, 
object, uh, this 60 points, but uh, no matter what, uh, I think it's interesting if we understood these 60 points in terms of a provisional, um, provisional and a revisable goals. So this point 20 is about a rural urban integration. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, rough translation. So this is put in a quite a broad and general terms, right? So it says, uh, accelerate the building of new forms of agricultural operation system, persist in the basic position of the house, uh, household operation in agriculture. So it still want to keep the household responsibility system as a basis of rural governance. But move forward with agricultural operation method innovation that jointly develop household operation, collective operations, cooperative operation, and enterprise operation. So what does it mean by cooperative, cooperative operation and enterprise operation? It could mean the, the enterprise, maybe the enterprise in the city who comes, which comes to the countryside to operate, become an aero business, like together with the rural cooperatives. So this is persist in the collective ownership of rural land. So they want to keep the collective ownership of rural land, not to privatize the collective ownership of the rural land. And the safeguard the land contracting and the operational rights of peasants according to the law, develop and expand the collective economy, stabilize rural land concentration, uh, a contraction relationship, and maintain their unchanged for a long time under the precondition of persisting in and uh, perfecting the strictest arable land protection system, endow peasants with power of possession, use, profit, transmission, mortgage, and the guarantee of contracting and operating powers with regard to their contracted land. Peasants are permitted to develop industrialized agricultural operation with the income from contracting operating rights. It is encouraged that contracting and operational rights are transferred to specialized large household, household farms, peasants collectives and agric agricultural enterprises on the open market, develop operations in many kinds, forms and scale. So this is very broad and kind of weak, but it, I think it's perfectly fit this uh, open ended and uh, provisional framework. So it's basically, he wants to keep uh, collective ownership of land, but also keep each household has a long term, up to 50 years, the lease right, but also want to encourage uh, cooperation and the economy of scale. So, uh, and uh, by allowing different forms of cooperations and urban enterprises to come to the countryside. So, so this is also uh, subject to the huge uh, debate and the different people with different ideology and different interests come up with totally different interpretations. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, there are many different forms of experimentation in different localities. But I, I, for the sake of time, I maybe I only mention two uh, of them. One is the, it actually has been going on for longer time before the uh, 18th Party Congress. It's so-called uh, uh, here, I, uh, I uh, sorry, I use this so-called shareholding and cooperative system on the basis of land. What does it mean, the shareholding and the cooperative system on the basis of land? So the, uh, uh, basically according to the 2007 Chinese new law on property, uh, the lease right of a peasant's household, the le lease, lease right, is considered a property rights. And uh, so this basically is that the peasants can use their lease right to enter in cooperation with the like, uh, companies from the urban area and uh, to use their lease right as a basis for the share of the future revenue 
of the aero business. So, so, so basically, the uh, a company in the urban area can come to the countryside and uh, bought the uh, uh, rebought uh, uh, this sum of the lease for a certain period. But in addition to that, they have uh, some guarantee for the dividend, minimum dividend, and also the more variable dividend for the peasant's household. So this is called shareholding and a cooperative system on the basis of land. This has been going on for longer time before the 18th party government. But there's something new, starting from actually maybe last November and last uh, uh, yeah. October, but uh, there were some limited experiment early on also, but the so-called land trust. So the trust law is very interesting. If you, some of the legal scholars in this room will remember a uh, famous legal scholar of British legal history, Maitland, uh, has a famous uh, act of the most important contribution of Englishmen to the whole world is the trust. Because in, in the civil law countries, like in Germany, France, there was no trust, no trust law. Because trust law, according to Maitland, why is so interesting? Because he's divided the traditional unified notion of ownership. Like uh, the trust divided at least the ownership right into three separate independent powers, like a right to, uh, like the uh, right, uh, this, uh, like the uh, principal and the trustee and the beneficiary. And uh, it's very difficult to pin down in the civil law language, like who is the final owner. There are a lot of debate about trust and what is the dead hand, so-called dead hand principle of trust. And, but this very interesting thing is like in Maitland, the trust is the most flexible and the important innovation in the British legal history. And as you know, that China, um, since the late Qing dynasty in the beginning of 20th century, uh, borrowed the civil law system from Germany. And, uh, but, uh, uh, China also introduced a trust law in the uh, 1980, in 1980s. And, but uh, interestingly, since last November, a large scale experiment in several localities based on the trust law uh, has been going on. Um, so basically, uh, it's dif indifferent from the shareholding and the cooperative system on the basis of land, I mentioned earlier, this land trust is basically like a trust company will come. Uh, uh, they made the like, rural collective, like the, the whole collective, rural, the village, uh, like a principle to, uh, and this trust company become a trustee. But for the benefit of each and every member of this village. And, uh, but what's different from the shareholding and cooperative system, I think there depends on the, there are many con concrete contract, but, but most basically is that uh, this aero business, like a enterprise from the city, in the land trust system, only become a service provider. And uh, uh, so before, maybe this aero business company in the, in the city come to sign a, a contract directly with the village. But in the land trust system, this rural agriculture, uh, aero business, uh, this urban aero business company will come, will sign a service contract with the trust company. And uh, depend on uh, some design of the con concrete design contract. So in one experiment in Anhui province, they gave 70% uh, of the uh, uh, increase of the basic rents to, to the beneficiary namely the each and every member of the village committee. And also, this mobilizes more f uh, financial resources because this trust company has more revenue, more channels for mobilizing necessary finance than uh, just a simple urban agribusiness. Agro -business. But, uh, so my, but my point here is not to evaluate concretely the success and the failure of each of those local experimental uh, approaches, both in terms of state-owned enterprises and in terms of uh, 
land system reform, in the rural land system, the land trust or shareholding and the cooperative system on the basis of land. Uh, but my, my, uh, but uh, my point is simply to illustrate that um, if we, s through this experimental governance perspective, we may gain some new insights on what's, uh, the, what's Xi Jinping's grand reform design is up to. But uh, of course, maybe this is my idiosyncratic interpretation. It is my, but uh, if you read uh, Umberto Eco's, uh, this Italian thinker and novelist, uh, he has a book called uh, Interpretation and Overinterpretation. But I, maybe <laughs> this is my overinterpretation, but I think it's not completely, uh, uh, it's not completely off the mark because uh, uh, um, um, because otherwise it's can, very difficult to make sense uh, of these very, very long documents, right? And, and uh, so, so my, so my, I will conclude. So basically my interpretation is that first is the overall goal then there was basically 60 points framework goal, provisional design, and then to allow local experiments. And then, uh, hopefully, they will be able to compare those local experiments and revise the, those framework goals. But however, I will conclude by, so this is the, I think there are some, still some weakness in, because this, I start by citing uh, Chuck Sable's uh, and Jonathan Zetlin's <laughs> article for the Oxford Handbook of Governance. So these are four points of, uh, four elements of experimental governance. So I think the first two totally apply perfectly in Chinese case. But uh, uh, in the second and the fourth, especially the second, I think the Ch Chinese practice already have implicit this peer review. Um, uh, and uh, uh, comparison of approach to different uh, different approaches to the same provisional determined goals. However, I think this process in China is less institutionalized. So uh, there are less open debate on the different approaches to the same provisional determined goal. So, so uh, th there are some, uh, uh, for example, I mentioned this Chongqing experiment starting from 2007 in my other, in my another talk earlier in new school. Uh, I think there were some many interesting points in the Chongqing experiment. However, it's get lost because for this political uh, scandal, but also that for the lack of fully open discussion and the debate. And uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, so the third point, third element of experimental governance, namely the through open discussion of the, and the peer review to compare different approach to the same provisionally determined goal uh, is not a f fully and not well developed in China so far. So it certainly is my hope that uh, it will be uh, developed further. So that leads to the end of my talk because that's the implication for political reform. And this, uh, one of the interesting thing about uh, experimental governance uh, is that uh, uh, so maybe I simply put, so the, the, the end of this quotation from Chuck is that uh, the assumption, in other words, is that structural impediments can best and perhaps only be identified and surmounted in the course of a reform process that generate concrete solutions, not in anticipation of it. Uh, because a lot of uh, Criticisms of about the Chinese political system implies that we uh, best approach is to confront the top immediately. And uh, but uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's like an interesting implication uh, uh, that this experimental governance argues that actually we don't have to confront, or even the best, or even the only way is to identify and surmount it in the course of a reform process that generate a concrete solution, not in anti anticipation of it. Oh, but of course, I, maybe this is too <laughs> optimistic a, a view of the world, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's not uh, 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 too, I mean, it's not without, uh, it's not without uh, reason because uh, 
Okay, so I guess maybe I, it's best for me to stop and uh, have your criticism, comments, and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I think all of you can see uh, why Professor Tsui is, has been dubbed one of the uh, leading figures of the Chinese New Left. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot to, 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 to debate, including the practical aspects um, of the future program of which he sees the seeds here. Uh, and as he mentioned, and I didn't mention in my introduction, among other things, he did work as the assistant director of the State Asset Management Committee of Chongqing government, as many of you already know, who were here at his earlier talk. And so there is a practical experience which is uh, very much uh, in the background when he speaks at the at an, even at a rather abstract level as he seemed to uh, uh, in his remarks today. Uh, so we have three discussants who are very uh, eminent ones. Uh, first of all, um, we have Mark Fraser, my colleague and co-academic director of the India-China Institute, who is a distinguished uh, uh, writer on the political economy of China with a focus on labor movements and social policy. And many of you know him and his work, so I don't have to go on at greater length about him, but he is a very apt discussant on these topics. Um, second, we have Chuck Sable, whose work has already been uh, extensively re referred to today. And let me apologize, Chuck, for not uh, knowing that, in fact, Mobius Strip ownership is attributable to you. But I'm not entirely surprised because of the intimate relation between the different ideas that uh, uh, are uh, uh, being have been discussed uh, over the years uh, by Professor Tsui and uh, Roberto Unger and others under the broad heading of democratic experimentalism, which you have um, uh, yourself, uh, of course, extensively um, uh, authored and been the architect of. Uh, the, uh, well, there's much to say about Professor Sable, uh, but I won't <laughs> say all of it, uh, except to say that he is currently Professor of Law and Social Science at Columbia Law School, which doesn't, of course, uh, do justice to the breadth of his uh, discipline-spanning interests and his uh, very deep, uh, uh, even profound innovations uh, in, um, in, in, in the field of well, maybe I could just as well as anything call it work in politics, which was the title of his first book, which I recommend to all of you. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Bamsi uh, Vakulabaranam, who is, uh, who we're very lucky to have here. Uh, this is in fact his last day here after a number of weeks in New York with us at the India-China Institute, uh, who is a professor of economics at the University of Hyderabad and a longtime friend of the India-China Institute. Uh, and somebody who's tried very hard to do comparative work on India and China and integrate them both and indeed other Asian countries into a comparative political economic analysis of what is happening under contemporary globalization. Uh, each of the speakers will have five to seven minutes, as I mentioned, and uh, we have a timekeeper on the right who will signal to you. So uh, please, uh, Mark, to start. Well, it, it's just a, a great honor to be asked to comment and, and to be asked to comment first on such a, a, a very rich um, and detailed exegesis of, of, of part of, you know, I think we had uh, two of the 60 points, two of the most important uh, of the 60 points, and it's not my intention to go into the other 58. Uh, there is an English translation uh, that, uh, that Professor Tsui provided uh, to me and others uh, this afternoon. Of course, it's been around since November when the, the party's uh, central committee issued the document uh, in Chinese and then for, for the uh, English speaking and English reading audience who was, as he said, very eager to try to interpret this and I remember very well this initial um, you know, reading of the, the joint communique and uh, very disappointing, uh, not enough of the word SOE reform and liberalization certainly in there. Um, and then this uh, um, satisfactory feeling that, oh, now the, the, once the, 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 the full text, the decision comes out, there's this sense of, uh, oh, well, he is, uh, he is going to deepen uh, liberalization processes in the SOE sector, which, you know, as, as he said, uh, 
like with any important document, one read, the, the people who read it bring their own interpretations, their own ideological positions into the reading and interpretation of, of, of that document. Uh, but what I wanted to do in, in uh, the, the brief time I have is to cover, uh, and just in response to, to hearing the talk, um, the, uh, provide some context on, on the Chinese context or the historical context of the Chinese Communist Party on the practice of experimental governance, because I think it's a very important tradition uh, that, that needs to be uh, understood uh, in this, this document. And then uh, talking uh, secondly about relations between the state, state agencies in particular, and state-owned enterprises, uh, and, and you know, they're both the state, but uh, I think there are, there are uh, major tensions uh, between uh, the two sides of the, the, that regulator and, and regulated divide. And then third, uh, to talk about something else that was in the, you know, I guess one or maybe two of the points that were in the, the 60 points was uh, corruption and anti-corruption, which is certainly uh, one of the ways that I think Xi Jinping and his administration is trying to, uh, you know, make a stamp uh, uh, on, on governance and, and the relationship possibly between the anti-corruption campaign that we're all hearing about and, and the uh, pursuit of some of these uh, specific goals. So with, with the uh, experimental governance, um, there is uh, a, a book that, that many people are, are citing these days uh, entitled Mao's Invisible Hand, <laughs> uh, invoking Adam Smith uh, with Mao. Uh, it's a, a book, it's an edited volume, and it contains many different chapters on, on both historical and contemporary uh, uh, political economy uh, of China, but particularly governance issues. And the, the main takeaway point that the editors and the, the chapter authors make is that in the Chinese communist governance tradition, there's a very rich history of not being wedded to rigid bureaucratic regulatory uh, governance structures. And we, we all, uh, most of us in this room anyway, uh, if, if you haven't read anything uh, uh, of the selected works of Mao anytime recently or ever, you probably know that he was a big enemy of bureaucracy. And the party has this long-standing, uh, almost dialectical relationship between uh, uh, effective governance, mobilization, campaigns, getting things done, and then the fear often, a, a, as Mao a, and his successors have always worried about, of how uh, uh, bureaucracy can seep in, uh, bureaucratic practices and rigidities can seep in, and what that does uh, to, to, to governance. So uh, the, the party has this, you know, going back to the base area days in the 1930s and 40s, when it, you know, com under combat, this notion of giving local officials who are out there by themselves in uh, base areas uh, and related uh, areas in which the CCP had to figure out relationships with uh, rural producers, what forms of ownership, what forms of, of taxation, what forms of, of public service, uh, of goods provision would be enacted. And I think that governance capacity uh, and an, a dedication to experimentalism uh, really uh, emerged from this. There's an expression uh, that, that's called, that would be translated into English as something like from point to surface. So that you take the most successful uh, experiments and then you try to uh, move them across the surface of the territory, move them across the national map, move them across maybe the provincial map. So we see this, you know, you could take this to special economic zones in the, the early reform era as another example of an experiment, looking at its lessons and then trying to uh, I'm not saying that it's automatic that the best uh, lessons are taken and the best practices are diffused and everybody's happy, but it is certainly a different approach to governance and regulation than we would think of uh, if we try to think in, in relatively narrow categories of, uh, you know, uh, uh, coordinated market economies, let's say, and, and uh, uh, liberal market economies are the categories that we're often used to seeing in studies of Western uh, political economies. Second point related to state uh, agency versus state-owned enterprise relations. Um, I, and, and this, I have, with this, I have a particular uh, a question for Professor Sway, and that is, um, should we think of these state-owned enterprises, you know, 100 only some odd enterprises these days, but with many, many, you know, branches and, and plants and factories and so forth and mines all over the world. Um, should we think of them as uh, powerful corporate interests that we would see in a Western uh, or a, any other uh, capitalist economy that is resistant to 
uh, attempts at regulation that, is, that are effective and becoming more effective at lobbying and will, uh, at the end of the day, if, if, uh, you know, if China is a capitalist economy, I'm not saying that it is, but you know, capitalism, uh, if we understand capitalism, we think that uh, the conclusion is that the, the, the business interests, the, the controllers of the, the owners of the means of production, are, are uh, the powerful ones and the, the regulators, the state, are the ones who are doing the bidding of the powerful. So, um, you know, is there going to be, and certainly there already is, a tension between uh, documents like this and, and efforts like this to, uh, to regulate and to, uh, you know, say to them, 30% of your revenues or maybe 30% of your profits have to be turned over in the form of essentially taxes to, to provide for social welfare. It seems to me that the prospects of resistance are very, very high. Uh, and I think this is not a new pattern, but it's something that, as this effort is ramped up, uh, I think the pushback could be uh, could be quite uh, c quite strong. Um, the other related question is: um, Does the document, as some people interpreting it uh, have said, does the document contain um, a greater uh, push for state-owned enterprises to have uh, to face competition? That is, that, that uh, it's one thing to have the mixed ownership pattern, but then to say that we're going to remove some of the uh, structural barriers and other kinds of barriers that have prevented you from facing more direct forms of competition, uh, that, that was just one of the things that I heard out of the you know, more, uh, uh, say, uh, liberal political economy approaches to the reading of this document was that, oh, state-owned enterprises will have to face competition now. And so doesn't it, uh, what do you, do you see competition being endorsed in this uh, and, and related to the, as uh, going back to my, uh, my prior question, won't there be pushback and resistance against such anti-competitive or I guess pro-competitive kinds of policies? The other thing that's very interesting, as I heard you're talking about uh, these companies uh, being listed on various exchanges, of course, is that uh, the, the securities regulators in China have said that you must uh, list your major shareholders. And what this has led to, very interestingly, I think, is uh, the New York Times and Bloomberg and other uh, you know, heavily resourced Western uh, media outlets going through every single corporate annual report of these places and figuring out who the major shareholders are, they're companies, they're not named individuals, figuring out that that's the nephew of Zhou Yongkang or Xi Jinping. This was uh, in 2012, Xi Jinping's family came under heavy fire for making billions uh, in, in the initial public offerings of many of these companies. Uh, Wan Jiabao's family, uh, you know, modest Uncle Wan, uh, his relatives were, were, you know, deemed to be super billionaires if you calculated based on the kinds of companies. And then just last week, Zhou Yongkang, the former Politburo Standing Committee member, uh, former as in stepped down in fall of 2012, is now under major investigation. No one's seen him. No one has seen his relatives. So uh, the Times is reporting on, on uh, something we knew, which is that many people in his family, including him, have disappeared, but that they were also uh, making billions on this. So. Um, it, I guess a, a question that emerges from this is, um, you know, it does, and it takes me into my final point, which is the anti-corruption campaign. So do you see, uh, or should we see this, you know, document and the, the, the specific texts that it has uh, in it about corruption, you know, saying things uh, that Xi Jinping has said way before he became uh, party secretary, uh, you know, that, that our governing capacity as a party, our, our governance uh, ability, is directly weakened by corruption. Uh, he, he told uh, officials in a province he was the, the party secretary of 10 years ago or so, uh, uh, rein in your family, rein in your friends, rein in your colleagues, rein in your personal staff, uh, because if you don't, then we'll all, we'll all collapse. So. Um, I, you know, it's a question, but I think it's also a, a, a point I'd like to, to throw out to everyone, which is that um, I see the anti-corruption effort as a direct part of, of this uh, effort to um, engage in structural reforms uh, of, of ownership and, and various forms of governance and regulation of, of the state-owned uh, state enterprises. Uh, and final point is, um, and question, 
given the complexities of the things you described, such as the land trusts, um, how it, it seems to me a, a, a recipe for um, all sorts of corruption by local officials to manipulate the market, to manipulate the asymmetries and in information that a farming family might have as they're engaging in a contract with a land trust. And, and the problem, uh, is it not, that um, in this document, there's nothing about um, anti-corruption being led by uh, you know, legal means or media or uh, NGOs. It's all the party will reform its anti-corruption efforts and we will uh, achieve our goals by uh, basically cleaning ourselves up but still being unmonitored by you know, any other outside uh, uh, organization. Okay, thank you very much. So it's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful pleasure to, uh, to be here and to, uh, to comment on the uh, extremely thoughtful uh, views of my, my old friend and, and uh, 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 f fellow traveler, I guess is the appropriate word, uh, Julian, and to see Sanjay again after, after some years. Um, I, uh, I want, <coughs> want to address my remarks uh, uh, to the, uh, the utility uh, of this, uh, this interpretation. Uh, that's self-interested. I, I want it, uh, you know. But but um, I, I also want want to say that it, one one of the things that's useful about it is that it suggests some very testable uh, uh, propositions, and uh, Jiwan mentioned some of them towards the end. But uh, against the backdrop that uh, uh, that, that Mark <coughs> filled in for us, uh, that there is culturally. But for want of a better word, there's some fit between between uh, the Chinese sense of uh, uh, working things through and, and going from general ideas to practice and back and forth. Uh, there's no reason not to call that dialectic in some deep way. Uh, and 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 the this more formalized uh, idea of experimentalism. Let's just. Assume that if you read the work of Sebastian Heilman or all the Dewey or the the result the accounts of Dewey's reception in China, uh, uh, there, there's something there's enough there for academic purposes. Now the question is: Is there enough something there that's actually worth something beyond that? So let me suggest that Juan just showed us at least. Uh, uh, that there li is likely and, and in what that would consist. And one way to, to do that is to ask, uh, I'm unencumbered by, by any particular knowledge of China, so it's easy for me to adopt the posture that I'm now going to suggest is of heuristic value. Uh, let's ask how, how someone would interpret this from the standpoint of uh, either a, a Western analysis of a, such a document, a, a legislative program, a government program, or from the point of view of somebody who is involved <coughs> in, in uh, let's call them sinological, the traditional fights uh, within, within communist parties, as those are interpreted either by Westerners who study such things or, or people who are in the midst of them themselves. Huh? So from the, the familiar West, the, the political science point of view, there's nothing, there's a completely obvious explanation which renders uh, this uh, completely uninformative and it, it, in fact useless as a point of orientation. And it's just that uh, there are lots of groups in China and they're fighting with each other and they needed to f put forth a document that would would be acceptable to all, at least to the point of view of, of from, in the minimal sense of allowing some consensus declaration that would gesture at this model as a program uh, worthy of a court. So, so one view is uh, there is no meaning to be sought, and the six, there could it was a good thing they, there was a, a precedent for stopping at 60 points because otherwise there would have been 600. And, and so that's, that's the first view. And the second view is uh, uh, 
that's wrong. There's a secret code uh, with which to read these things. And some words mean more or other than what they say. And, and uh, uh, the difference between fundamental and decisive is decisive or fundamental, depending on which code you have. And, and uh, it, then you can argue about the codes. And, and, uh, uh, and from that point of view, too, the actual substance is irrelevant because you're looking for the master word or phrase or the hi hierarchy of assertions that reveals to you what's the actual dominant, the predominant uh, uh, line, uh, the, uh, the thrust, uh, the axis of action. So, Juan proposes another alternative. And the alternative is that people actually mean something. Not something completely precise, but something recognizable, actionable, and something which they can agree is worthy of practical investigation. And he gave us two quite amazing examples. Point six and, and point 20. And why, why do I say they're amazing? Because you could just say, well, you know, that's not a very hard test. Not, not a very hard test. Uh, uh, something that's, that's uh, uh, less than hopelessly general, uh, but not obviously implementable in its current degree of precision. How hard is it to think of words that fit that criteria, th those criteria? Not so hard. Not so hard. But that isn't actually what I heard. And it was only upon hearing this that I actually, that, that, that I, I you, you could begin to see the full force of, of, of uh, the interpretation. Because what I, what I heard was a description of institutions that I never heard of before. Lots of them, not, not just one or two, but a cascade of institutional forms that, yes, Mark, you're right, they're, they, they may contain, they're, they're not simple, but the question is not whether they're not simple in the sense that they're Baroque, susceptible of obfuscation, easily manipulated, or they're not simple in the sense that they don't simply fit our existing categories. And I think they may be the first, but they're absolutely certainly the second, as illustrated by this idea of trust. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't repeat the, the various forms, but they're intriguing. They're intriguing. They, so, sometimes they're distinctive in themselves, and sometimes they link familiar organizations in a way that you, 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 your experience is broader than mine. But I'm, I'm a connoisseur of uh, bizarre possibilities, and, and, where, and, and it's like coming across some, some, uh, some zone of life where none of the creatures are cognizable. You, you, you recognize the, their, their, their evolutionary affinities, but you, even without being able to assign them a taxon, you know there's something different. And there were a lot. There were a lot. And they seem purposeful. They seem purposeful. The, this notion of a trust, for example, but the, the, the point is not, to get to the bottom of them because they don't have a bottom because they don't have a top. But they do mark the way forward. So the first thing is that by taking seriously the possibility that there might be something to take seriously, uh, you bring to light a whole series of propositions that are simply discarded in the familiar interpretations. Just not there. And not only are they not, it isn't a, they're not mappable onto the familiar interpretations. And they suggest not just the possibility that the Chinese might be <clears throat> doing something experimental, but that, the, that they might actually be, in fact, they must obviously be doing something deeply novel. Not experimenting not experimenting to find ways, new ways to familiar things, but finding new things, finding new things. 
let me come because time is short. Uh, let, me, let me come to the empirical parts and the challenge. So, Juan said quite correctly, I, at least I think, that the, 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 these, this simple four-part schematic, the third and the fourth parts are, are much harder to demonstrate. Uh, the third part, the peer review, if you read this uh, Heilman and these others, uh, and, and the, the literature about how the cadre system works, there is some informal system the party schools, many, many different things, quite, quite complex. Not easy to know how generation after generation, when there are more failures than successes, the failures get picked for propagation. That's not a trivial problem to solve, and yet the Communist Party has solved it over in an iterated way without formalizing. So there's a question, is this a step in the direction of formalizing it? And then there's a further question, about is this a step towards formalization, which also opens to broader discussion, democracy, all, all the words that are at the at, at the size. The, the last point, the last point. Uh, I concur completely that the, the this idea that uh, uh, I, I suppose in in that in the thing you 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 cited the the. The, the notion is there are no there are no abstract at, there are no abstract answers to the deepest structural problems. So, for example, Marx said we we can we we should we should be very cautious because the party asserts the right the exclusive right to to uh, uh, prosecute root out corruption. That seems impossible, that the agent of corruption would be the agent of anti-corruption. That doesn't, and the obvious response then would be, so we need an anti-corruption agency. And the obvious response to that is, that obviously won't work. We, we know that that won't work. And so at one level, the claim is banal. We, we can't just proclaim these things. But the question is, and it's an empirical question, we should be able to go to different places and see these experiments in progress. We should be able to go to different places and see whether the, there are, is a profusion of new mechanisms for pooling information. And we should be able to go and see whether that spills over, to use a very old-fashioned kind of word, but ramifies into, reverberates into, a deeper kind of change that addresses these structural limits. Wonderful. Thank you, Sway, for a very fascinating presentation. Uh, it's really hard for me to discuss this presentation because I just heard it. And uh, I can't read Chinese, so I haven't read the 60 points of the you know, uh, third plenum. But let me comment uh, you know, on uh, uh, the economic aspects. Let me just uh, throw out three, four comments. Uh, I think you know, the fundamental value of your presentation is that you, know, you provide a certain interpretation which uh, uh, makes it clear that you know, the 60 points can be interpreted in multiple ways. Right? So uh, the value of that for me, you know, when I think about the Chinese context, is that what will actually happen in the next decade or so will be determined not by the text of you know uh, uh, or the 60 points but actually you know what real struggles are going to take place around these multiple interpretations and which direction uh, is china going to be pushed i think and i think it's therefore important that you know these multiple in interpretations are made and you know, people uh, start fighting around or you know, organizing their struggles around that. I think that's uh, the value of the presentation as I see it. Uh, but one thing struck me, you know, uh, you know, especially after the global crisis of 2008 and you know, the uh, fact that uh, you know, now everybody knows that China has uh, a very high level of inequality and this has to be addressed. Why uh, is the entire focus on this old uh, and worn out debate about market versus the state you know that, that you know that's the you know axis around which 
seemingly this uh, entire document seems to be positioned. And that was a little, you know, I was struck by the strangeness of the, uh, this, you know. Why is there no uh, direct emphasis on something like inequality? Why, why are they not talking directly about, you know, creating, uh, you know, more domestic demand, for instance? You know, why can't the 60 points be focused around that question, especially when it's clear that, you know, Chinese economy has slowed down considerably relative to its own uh, growth rates earlier. And uh, there's some kind of a sense of a crisis, economic crisis, right? So, so that's the first point. I mean, uh, the second point is, you know, uh, while uh, uh, your interpretation is valuable, uh, I do have some skepticism about, you know, uh, your interpretation, especially when you started, you said, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, one uh, thing I've read, you know, when the document actually came out is, you know, the basic, I mean, market used to play a basic role, right, in the earlier documents. You said fundamental. Uh, and, you know, they changed it to the word decisive. Uh, and, you know, the Chinese policymakers are never innocent, right? That word actually means something. It's not mere semantics. So they do want to, you know, do something with this uh, new formulation. But your interpretation seems to suggest that, you know, that's, that is not necessarily the case. So, that, so there I'm a little skeptical, you know. Clearly, there is something that, uh, 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 you know, the policy makers mean to do, right? Uh, and uh, point six, you know, could be interpreted. And uh, I, I'm asking the question, why are you not, uh, why are you disregarding that interpretation? Point six could be interpreted as public sector divestment, you know, disinvestment from the public sector, which has been, uh, you know, a huge demand in the Chinese context for a long time. So why is that, inter I mean, you didn't provide enough argument uh, to, to actually, uh, you know, question that interpretation, right? Or uh, if you come to point 20, uh, you know, there are lots of struggles in rural areas around land, right? Lots of protests and so forth. So why is this not a, a clever way of rendering land as a commodity? I mean, these are uh, questions that, uh, uh, you know, that immediately come up in the context of, you know, uh, reformulating market uh, in a more decisive role, right? So is it a process of commodification, right? So that's the uh, second point. And uh, from your presentation, I got the sense that, you know, somehow in an oblique way, uh, in a non-transparent way, uh, you know, this, this will address inequality. I'm also colored by your Friday presentation on Chongqing. Uh, so, you know, somewhere you feel that, you know, uh, uh, in an indirect way, this will address questions of inequality. But I don't see, you know, apart from your interpretation about land trust, uh, you know, which could potentially address the rural-urban divide. Although I'm still not clear how it will do exactly. Uh, you know, how is the inter-regional inequality going to be addressed? How is the, you know, uh, the intra-urban inequality, especially the class inequality that has really, uh, you know, uh, uh, become very significant, how is that going to be addressed you know, through any of these points. And uh, that's a, uh, I think, you know, that has to be carefully understood, you know, even if you are willing to uh, give it a, a different interpretation. So, uh, so to, you know, combined with other things like, you know, uh, you know, when, when I read the other interpretations, people talk about, you know, capital account liberalization, for instance, you know, which is part of the 60 points, right? Complete uh, liberalization of the capital account. But, Right. So some people have, yeah, some people have interpreted it as, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the document suggesting, you know, complete capital account liberalization. Um, and, you know, uh, it's clearly stated, I think, in the document that resource allocations uh, will not be mediated by the state any longer. Market will take over, you know, uh, soon. So let me leave you with a large question. Uh, you know, going back to David Harvey, uh, you know, is, is this an attempt to sort of complete the project of, uh, you know, uh, 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 creating a neoliberal China or, you know, having neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics as opposed to socialism with Chinese characteristics. Thank you. Thank you. We have very little time, and I'm sure there are other questions, a number of distinguished faculty uh, who are present here and others. So, excuse me. If I may ask the, uh, our senior leader, Ashok Gurung, if we may go five minutes beyond uh, eight, and if there's no up 
the, the general uprising against that. Uh, yeah. That will give us a few minutes to for us to collect some questions, and then we can go back to Professor Sway for his uh, reaction. Uh, so let me uh, ask if any of you have questions to please raise your hands. I see a number of them. So I'll start on the right side and come to this side. Uh, Professor Lily Ling, first of all. Thank you. Yes, please, if you wouldn't mind, because this is being uh, live webcast, it would be helpful if you uh, spoke into a microphone. Okay. Um, I've now had the pleasure of hearing Professor Tsui speak on three occasions, and so now I think I have a better understanding of your intellectual project, and so my comment is really on your intellectual project, which is a very different perspective from those of economists who tend to focus on uh, outcomes and, and um, empirics. Um, previously, you talked about the liberalism in Chinese socialism. Uh, you refer to James Mead and, and other characters like that. And I was a little bit puzzled why you were doing that. Today, what I heard was the socialism in Chinese liberalism. And this uh, tended to balance the intellectual project more in that you were recognizing the liberalism in socialism as well as the socialism in liberalism. And this intellectual project uh, is highly evocative of uh, traditional Chinese thought, particularly uh, dialectical thought. And given this then, uh, uh, the response to Chuck Sable's question about these novel ideas, particularly in conceiving of the central government and local governance loosening a little bit to allow for experimentation, it evokes actually ancient Chinese experimentation before the communist revolution. And in particular, I'm thinking of the Huainanzi. The Huainanzi was a classical Taoist document of, uh, of government, governance, governance according to Taoist uh, dialectical principles. And it focused in particular on the relationship between a central uh, ruling force and localities. And it conceived of this relationship in a lively, experimental, and uh, flexible way. So it suggests to me that your intellectual project would benefit from identifying Chinese sources of this kind of thinking so that it does not seem to the uninitiated uh, that these are novel ideas, but rather have deep roots, deep organic roots, and that uh, this answers uh, some of the uh, empirical questions about you know experimentation and outcomes and things like that uh, to place it within a larger historical, cultural, and intellectual context. And given that, given that you are working towards identifying a Chinese understanding of the relationship, not only between center and periphery, but socialism and liberalism, I think that this will contribute tremendously to current discourses so that we are not seeing neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics, not at all, but rather we are seeing something, maybe an updated Huainanzi. Thank you. Thank you. So we have very little time, so if I could ask the remaining questioners to please be brief, I'd appreciate it. We would appreciate it very much because otherwise there'll be no chance to hear response at all. So I think uh, there was one, was there any other hand on this side? I'm going to take uh, both of you, Professor Riskin to, at the end. Please, if you don't mind, just because it's being videotaped and, and live webcast, uh, a live webcast is taking place. Yeah, please. So my name is Alassia Lefebure, Columbia University, and I've had the pleasure to work at Tsinghua many years ago with, with uh, Zhu Yuan. The question, very brief. Um, so you, um, you seem to suggest that this experimental, experimental governance, Xi Jinping one, uh, is different from the previous one. Uh, because of this formalization, and, and even though you point out the lack of debate, sufficient debate for the moment, um, I would like to, to ask you if you can reflect on your own experience as an intellectual and a scholar in the administration, in the local government. It's not something that only you did. It's something that it's more and more common among your colleagues, especially in School of Public Affairs, Public Administration. Is this practice going to influence according to you, this, this Xi Jinping style experimental governance? What is the role of intellectuals in China today when they go to local government? How this 
accelerates or not the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have two, two, well, there are two questions. Goodness, suddenly there's been a propagation. I see now four hands, and we really don't have time unless you literally take 30 seconds each. Raise your hands if you can take 30 seconds each. <laughs> Okay, so we have four, please, gentlemen at the back. <laughs> would, you, would you mind speaking from the front, if you don't mind, yeah. And uh, please, our timekeeper, could you please keep time and raise your hands, because we now have very little time left. Thank you. Davide Gualerzi, University of Padua, Italy. Very simple, two questions. Can we summarize in extreme, simplistic terms, that what you're saying is that within same ownership relationship, the reform implies further private capital penetration and that we are interpreting in that sense the difference between fundamental and decisive role of the market in resources allocation. Second question, I didn't understand fully the role of the state in these mixed enterprises, especially the first model. I understood two things. One, you want to get rid of employees' <coughs> participation in order to be listed in the Shanghai Stock uh, Exchange. And, well, well, then and you have to, um, and then now, and the second question is that uh, I don't understand. Is state in one sentence, please? Is, Sorry. Is, is state is the state going to retain that uh, macroeconomic governance that you said is not to be allowed to the private investors? Thank you so much. Thank you. Please. Uh, I'm sorry. First, the lady. Uh, yes, okay. Professor uh, Chin. Thank you. Hello. I'm Chin Gao. I'm a professor at uh, Fordham University, currently also a visiting scholar at the India-China Institute. My question is, uh, most of the 60 points, as you talked about, are purposefully left very vague and ambigu ambiguous. However, there's one point which you mentioned is that the government requires those uh, enterprises to contribute 30% of their public, uh, their um, capital gains to uh, people's livelihood, which is very ambitious and very definite. So people could hold the government uh, uh, accountable. And my, uh, and some other people's estimates currently uh, say the government only contribute only spends up to 10 percent or even at a low level of 5 percent on public finance, public uh, people's livelihood. How could they jump to 30 percent by 2020? Thank you. Thank you. And we have two more questions. First, uh, yes, um, and then uh, Carl Riskin. Thank you. To end. <laughs> okay. Oh. okay, Martin Rivlin, Columbia and CUNY. Um, thing on, um, what Charles Sable said is very interesting, but the question, of course, will be implementation, as you and I both know. All right, very quickly, because um, of time, what do you seem to, you, is there a systemic implication, or is it just another of an example in this corruption charge against uh, Jo Yun Gang? And finally, which you don't have to answer, do you expect any reevaluation in June 4th? Okay, finally, Carl Riskin. Uh, and then uh, after that, Professor Tsui has three minutes to respond. <laughs> Maybe five if you're all generous to him. I'm going to stand up to show how quick I'm going to be. Uh, as of something like two, 2007, there were about 66 million peasants who had already lost their land to land grabs. Uh, Joe Chi Ren came to Colombia recently and to speak about land grabs and the struggle for land, but he talked about these land trusts. I listened very carefully, but I didn't understand how that was going to solve the problem. Perhaps, uh, Julian, you can explain that? Thank you. <laughs> Julian, please. Uh, I, I, I'm going to take the liberty of saying you can have five, all right? And then we'll uh, end promptly. Please. <laughs> so, so thank you uh, all for those uh, very challenging questions. I, I wish I could answer, <laughs> we wish I, I could answer all of them, but I, I really do not have a, a ready answer to many of them. And uh, uh, about Mark's point about uh, yeah, corruption, I agree with you, it's, it's a very serious po problem. And uh, as a matter of fact, actually, one of the 60 points ex uh, explicitly address that uh, the party want to bring in more uh, new 
stakeholders in the anti-corruption campaign. For example, the media has been playing more important role. Just like last week, there was important uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, Hua, uh, some Hua, Hua, Hua Run, yeah, this very, uh, uh, this, this, there was a reporter kept uh, writing letters, right? Just two weeks ago, the, this uh, CEO of Hua Run, the big state-owned company has been, uh, they, whose name is Song Lin has been uh, dismissed. And so uh, there's, but the, the documents, there's one point explicitly uh, ask more social participation, bring in no new actors in the process, and uh, also they uh, simplify the registration for the NGOs. So this, this also different localities, like Guangzhou for Guangdong, uh, maybe uh, went f has gone further uh, in the simplification for the registration of NGOs. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, about the Zhu Yongkang, and several of you mentioned the Zhu Yongkang case, I, I don't know the detail, of course, but I think, uh, yeah, there are some still, uh, people can think of the degree of difference. Like, for example, if uh, uh, your son or the wife were corrupted, and there's, there's, there's some degree of difference between, like, for example, your sister, uh, Maybe had some made became rich. And then there, I think people still can make some, but uh, uh, but the, I think the uh, uh, so, 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 somehow I, I got lo lost track of the, <laughs> and, and, uh, 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 oh about the land trust uh, and the car car point. Uh, yeah, but first of all, I don't think the sixty six. 66 million peasants lost their land. I think that's, the figure must be too high. It's not, I mean, it's not possible. And it's a basic uh, fundamental regime uh, in the rural land ownership is still, uh, has still been kept. And, uh, and we, uh, I think we should uh, give more space and, uh, and for those local experiments, but I, I also have some worry because, the, as I relate to the third point uh, in comparison to the experimental governance, because the relative lack of transparency and uh, open debate, so the comparison of different approaches may not uh, have been fully developed. I think that's the weak point of uh, Chinese, ex Chinese version of experimental governance, and we should strengthen it by all means. And uh, so that I think that's really to. Uh, the point about the role of scholars. I think I personally learned a lot by working in one and a half year in the, the local government. And uh, yeah, because I learned a lot, because I think the scholars uh, tend to, including myself, uh, I mean, to think in a very abstract way and uh, try to find the ready answers in advance. But uh, I mean, this working experience in local governments, uh, I, I think I, so became, uh, I'm becoming more and more interested in pragmatism as a way of thinking. But I'm glad Professor Lin mentioned this has a deep Chinese cultural roots in Huainan. <laughs> so I, I want to learn more from you. And uh, I think my classical Chinese education is, is, too, is too limited. But I, I should definitely learn more. Uh, and uh, I must have missed some important questions. I, but I, maybe I, sh I should end here. So thank you again for your wonderful questions. Yeah.